Um, you could look at um, bone marrow as your target organ and try and keep the dose there to less than two gray. Uh, or you could be using it as a neoadjuvant treatment to render a patient potentially suitable for surgery and perhaps in the future we might have agents for pancreatic cancer that might target that um, so that people can go on to successful surgery where now they can't. But overall, whatever you choose here, our aim should be to improve overall survival. So I'm going to draw on a couple of papers that have been published in the last decade looking at the, um, uh, the use of clinical um, uh, radiation dosimetry calculations. The first one was mostly written by uh, medics um, asking, come on physicists, when are you going to get it together? And the other is the um, seven year later response from the physicists as to what they're up to. Now, um, when you think about how we approach treatments, uh, and, and this has been referred to in the previous session as well, you can start with little or no um, patient specific information, such as we do with iodine therapy, have been doing for 50 years or more. Uh, it's the one size fits all approach that John Matthew referred to. Um, you could go for a little bit of information, and again, with surspheres, we often use a BSA formula where we perhaps erroneously think that the liver size is related to the BSA. It's not always um, applicable in, play, in um, the setting of primary or metastatic liver cancer. But you somehow modify the dose based upon the patient's um, body habitus. And at the other end of the spectrum, is, as I say, what the radiation oncologists are doing today, time-consuming, precise definitions, dose painting, trying to get maximal doses to tumour, minimising the splash dose and normal tissues, and even providing boost doses, often based on the functional images, as you can see here from FET PET scanning combined with the MRs. So it's clear that when you go from the, the less specific to the more specific, you need a lot more information, you need a lot more time, that's certainly for sure. Today, of course, the lutate treatments, as we've been hearing, are very much uh, standardised. Um, like jean Matthew, we are locked into a um, predefined protocol that doesn't allow us any ability to vary the dose given, so there are four standard doses in our department. We are looking, however, at things like um, trying to get the surspheres moved from minimal information to something far more precise, um, and looking at things like imageable spheres and pre-treatment planning. The obvious advantage and attraction of the um, standardised dosing regime <coughs> is, is that it, um, it's easy to implement, um, but it neglects a lot of factors, and if you sit in your um, cancer board meetings or your MDTs, you hear a lot about this. Um, it's not just the size of the patient, it's their tumour burden that matters, it's the tumour uptake, it's the rate of progression, the trajectory that we're seeing in this patient as we followed them in their progression path. Uh, it's also recognising the interlesional heterogeneity and listening to Ben uh, Lawrence's talk this morning, there's clearly so many other genetic factors that you could throw into this. So the two patients I'm showing here are 46 kilogram lady and a 111 kilogram male, both for um, lutate therapy, both given exactly the same amounts of uh, treatment. Um, there's not a whole lot of sense behind that. So if I look at the, the first paper, these were the goals that were put out for individualised patient dosimetry. To get a, an individual minimum effective and maximum tolerated absorbed dose, uh, and I think importantly the second one, to us try and establish a dose response relationship based on particular pathologies uh, with certain treatments. Um, using the pre-therapy dosimetry to do that. To provide some objective comparison between dose-response relationships from different radionuclide therapies, and we're hearing about lutetium, copper, yttrium-90, and so on, uh, either between different patients or between different radiopharmaceuticals, and um, as well to perform comparisons with the results from external beam therapy. Now, I think we're all of the opinion that we shouldn't be applying external beam dose limits to kidneys, livers and, and other organs, but we still have to define what our own limits are. And so we need to uh, work that out. And we basically want to increase the knowledge of the clinical uh, radiobiology. And um, when you look at the literature, a lot of this tailed off for radionuclide therapy in the mid-90s, having been very active from the 60s and 70s, and it's starting to be readdressed again. When we talk about dose response, this is the sort of thing we're looking at. The curve on the left from Stefan Warren and um, his group showing a dose response for PRRT using yttrium-90, where the doses are calculated on the bottom for different lesions. And this is the size reduction uh, by resist criteria. And uh, some CERT-related uh, information from Patrick Flam and, and uh, uh, Bruno van der Linden in uh, Brussels, where they use predictive dosimetry from MAA pretreatment planning for CERT therapy to look at then change in the uh, total lesion glycolysis with FDG. And then we did a similar study, but 
Uh, as you heard, you can, you can image yttrium 90 quantitatively on the PET camera. So we actually measured the, the doses on the PET camera and related that to the same parameter, the change in TLG, and perhaps not surprisingly got very similar results to the, uh, the Brussels group. So these are the sorts of things we're trying to establish. Now, what is the evidence for the use of individualised dosimetry? And the previous chairman raised a question about this, and I think it's a great question. So in the paper that I referred to from uh, 2014, they looked under this search mesh, which you can see is fairly sensible, um, some sort of therapy and like some sort of response, including a term related to grey, but not related to external beam radiotherapy. 92 papers, predominantly phase one and two, as you can see, but 34 uh, were just stamp collecting exercises, basically, with no defined protocol as such. Dosimetry was reported in the majority of the papers, nearly 80 out of the 92. Uh, overall survival was reported in a substantially lesser number, only 22 of 79. Quality of life, which is almost essential for publishing in the uh, clinic oncology literature, was reported in one of 79 papers. Um, so something we do need to pay attention to, and that has been highlighted to us throughout today as well. Um, the pathologies for which this has been published as well, um, obviously thyroid cancer, um, both um, um, malignant and benign thyroid disease, uh, neuroblastomas with MIBG, NETS of course, lymphoma, going back to the uh, Zevalin and um, rituximab story, um, for CERT in liver cancer, for more recently in bone palliation with samarium and, and other uh, agents for that, and uh, a few others with monoclonal antibodies using yttrium 90 and lutetium 177. So that's where it's been attempted to be applied to patients. Now, again, another decision, and I think there's been a bit of discussion about this in the last session, is if you're going to do personalised dosimetry, how do you do it? And I'd like to suggest there's actually three different ways you can go about it. You can use a tracer dose approach, so you use the same radionuclide for the planning and for the therapy. Um, we sort of do that anyway with I131, although we don't plan before thyroid ablation, but certainly in surveillance scanning, we, we're essentially doing that. Um, with rituximab, which I have no experience with, I'm told that you need to do a tracer dose to establish the uh, amount of uh, bone marrow dose, which is uh, at the organ at risk in this example. And you could imagine it doing with lutetium 177PRRT. But the very low photon flux from uh, gamma flux from lutetium 177, I think, wouldn't make for the best data. So that's one way of doing it. Or, as we're talking about at this meeting in particular, using a suitable theranostic pair. Uh, I-124 and I-131 has been used extensively at Memorial Sloan Kettering for planning thyroid treatment. Every thyroid patient gets a planning scan with iodine-124 and PET. Copper-64, Copper-67 is a particularly attractive example because it's the same um, element being used in both cases, and so there's no sense that the molecule might be slightly distorted and therefore the affinity might change because of that. Um, one that I'd like to highlight to you, which I think is of great interest, uh, gallium-67 and lutetium-177. I heard gallium-67 referred to this morning as an old nuclear medicine uh, radionuclide. Uh, we still do lots of gallium scans for infection in our hospital because our uh, infectious diseases department really like it. There's also uh, yttrium-86, which is a PET um, radionuclide that you can use with yttrium-90. The third option you've got is to just use your initial treatment dose to individualise all the subsequent treatments. And this is particularly attractive because um, you, you don't have to do any sort of planning scan. And the planning scans can be very um, time consuming and difficult. Um, so you'd imagine doing this for the dotatates, your PSMAs, for example. Now, I'm going to look at the radionuclides that I don't think are suitable for planning. If you're trying to get a time integrated curve of the uptake and retention or washout, um, the first three, gallium-68, fluorine-18 and technetium, are clearly the workhorse radionuclides of nuclear medicine, and I'm saying they're not suitable. I don't really think one time point at 60 minutes after injection is going to be sufficient to capture the variability in biology that we see between patients. Um, I also put yttrium-90 up there, although I thought the paper using yttrium-90 dotatop we just saw was very interesting in the ability to be able to get an image uh, from a systemic injection of yttrium-90. I think. You can get a good PET image from yttrium 90 when you've got a one to two gigabecquerels contained in a region of the body such as the liver, but it's very challenging a systemic injection. So for that reason, in spite of the longer half-life, I've put down that that's not really a suitable way to plan therapy. What do I think would be suitable? Copper 64, clearly. We've heard a bit about that today because of the longer half-life. Um, gallium 67, I'll come back to that. Yttrium 86, indium 111, has been mentioned a few times today, can be used for both planning and for uh, treatment. And the iodines, 124, 123, 131, 
um, with their longer half-lives or lend themselves to the ability to be able to use for planning. Gallium-67, I think, need, might need a bit of revision. Um, we've done some work recently looking at the imaging the upper two peaks that we conventionally image with uh, in nuclear medicine, neglecting the lower one at 93 keV, and you still can get some very excellent image quality. Um, and you can also do it simultaneously with technetium on board. So the gamma camera's energy resolution has the ability to separate those. So I think that's um, also that you can substitute gallium-67 where you might use gallium-68, say on a dotatate molecule. Uh, I think could make it potentially attractive if you wanted to use the tracer dose approach to um, planning a therapy. So something perhaps to think about going forward. And we've certainly made some gallium-67 dotatate in our institution. How do you calculate this dosimetry once you've chosen what you're going to do? Well, you do need quantitative imaging, ideally in 3D, ideally with CT. If it's 2D, uh, like most of it has been for the majority of the time we've been doing dosimetry, we're stuck with using uh, planar images and then revert, revert to MERD pamphlet number 16, seen here, which describes how we make those images uh, quantitative as we can and then obtain time, uh, time activity curves of percent injected dose. We need somehow to identify the organs, and this is, of course, the major challenge in planar imaging with the amount of overlap that we have. Um, we need multiple time points determined by the biology, uh, usually over multiple days, and therefore we need that right half-life to match the biology. And it's got to be under the same conditions as for the therapy. So if we're talking about the dotatates, uh, we use radiosensitizers in our, in our institution, seven days of uh, capsidabine prior to treatment. And then you've got a three-hour amino acid infusion, which you would need to do in your tracer study as well. Therefore, complicates it quite a bit. Uh, you might want to also think about blood sampling to estimate the dose to the bone marrow. You then go on, you select your organs somehow, uh, displaying the significant uptake on your planning study. You define either VOIs or regions of interest. Um, uh, these days, a lot of good segmentation tools available for 3D work. You then get that percent injected dose in the organs, and Usually there's a few assumptions about some organs, such as the bone marrow and the gut, where there's obviously a very large distribution it's difficult to, to uh, define. The good news is that there are plenty of software applications coming through that you can use now to do this dosimetry. The uh, Linda EXM package uh, has been the standard for a long time, accepted by the FDA, based on planar imaging. Um, but there are other um, packages. There's a company called Dosisoft from France that have got a package for Y90. Philips have got a package adapted from um, radiation oncology called Stratos. ABX Crow, who I've noticed here on a stand, have got a package called QDOS, which does spec and planar imaging work. Um, GE have a package, as does the Siemens. So everybody's sort of getting into this now, realising that there will be a need to do this sort of dosimetry calculation. So here's an example from a copper 64 sartate image. Um, you can see that it's very easy to define these regions for lungs, livers, a region in the heart to look at the, the blood. Um, it's just so simple in 3D. Um, it really is very easy. But if you're stuck with these sorts of images, which is what we are at the moment with Dotatate, then we're doing blank scans with cobalt sheet sources, transmission scan prior to injection, followed by subsequent emission scans. And we use the transmission and the blank to derive an attenuation correction for the entire body, and then we end up with this quantitative image here. And then, so here's a comparison of a patient from our department, the gallium dotatate scan showing multiple um, lesions from a neuroendocrine tumour primary seen here, multiple lesions in the liver. This is the uptake uh, of the lutetium dotatate immediately at the end of injection with 100% of the activity remaining in the body. And then over two, uh, two and a half hours later, roughly 24 hours and three days later. And so we've done a lot of work with these data to look at retention and two different individuals shown here one with a very rapid clearance early on, and then a slow component. And this is this bi-exponential nature is what we see in all of the patients here, slower clearance, um, and then uh, slower initial clearance, and then the longer part there. Um, it is terribly, terribly reproducible. We derive these data from the whole body planar images, which are quantitative, um, using the MERD approach. And you can nearly overlie them most of the time. So I think you could use the first treatment to plan the subsequent ones with a fair degree of um, reliability. You've got to make the SPECT imaging quantitative if you want to use SPECT for that purpose. And um, so there's been some work done in this area, uh, Peter Mack here, and um, also with ourselves. Uh, and we've been looking at some performance parameters for that, as physicists like to do. And you can see that we can actually get quite good quantitative uh, values for reconstructions uh, in, in phantoms with lutetium, with sort of um, 
therapeutic amounts in the phantom, but we also like to validate these in vivo, and here we're looking at the concentration in the uh, contents of the left ventricle compared to a venous blood sample taken during the SPECT acquisition, and you can see that we can actually get a fairly good agreement, <coughs> pardon me, between the, uh, those two measures, indicating that even in vivo, in a very um, non-homogeneous area of attenuation of the body in the thorax, we can still get very good um, quantification with Lutetia 177. Uh, we also like to have a standard in the field of view just as a bit of an insurance policy to make sure that we, uh, nothing's gone systematically wrong. And looking here at 116 imaging sets with treatment where we know the, the activity inside the phantom, uh, the, the calibration standard, you can see that we're within 1% of accuracy all the time. So um, most of the time on average. So um, I think we are able to now use quantitative spec for lutetium 177 and certainly the manufacturers are heading in this direction as well. Uh, we've published a number of papers on the use of lutetium and gallium uh, for this, uh, in particular looking at the, um, the quantification accuracy and then using that to look at the biodistribution. To do the renal dosimetry, as everyone's been talking about, we follow the same sorts of methods as others. We segment based on the CT scan, relax that region a little bit and look at the total counts within that on the spec scan. Um, we then plug that into a Linda typically. We've got a number of time points there and uh, we get the integrated time activity curve, a uh, number of disintegrations, and that comes out for a certain administered dose to give us, in this example, 2.1 grey to the kidneys. So that's the standard that we've been using. We've also noticed what Joel Matthew was referring to, that um, it seems that those patients who do get a higher kidney dose calculated from these measurements um, generally have a lower GFR, and we're now looking at this in a larger series. Um, these are not corrected for organ mass at the moment, and I think it's going to get even tighter when we do that. So it's a message that when you see variability in the, the doses uh, for different patients, have a look at their renal function, because that might be the clue as to why you're seeing that. And we produce a standard output showing the kidney dose per cycle, uh, the amount administered, and certain retentions. So then we know if we can treat again. Now, where are we heading with all this? It's, I, what I've told you so far hasn't made your life any easier. Now what I'm going to tell you is actually hopefully going to make your life a bit easier. Um, I want to try and move all this work towards 3D only imaging with a gamma camera. My vision is that the patient for the bone scan will come in, lie on the bed, have a whole body spec CT and walk out the department. And that'll be the end of it. It won't be successive planar scans, spot scans, spec to the lumbar spine, spec to the thoracic spine. Just do it like a PET study. And what we're going to get out of this are quantitative images. So what I'm showing you here is a uh, planar scan, a bone scan compared with a planar scan derived from reconstructed spec data. And there's not much in it at the moment. And this is very early work that we've started. I think it's only going to get better. So we want to move away from planar imaging altogether for routine scanning, as I mentioned, for the bone scan, but also for all this dosimetry work. Much better if we could have whole body spec CT. We want to replace that planar imaging with whole body spec CT at each time point for, to derive the biodistribution for the dosimetry, and with the proviso that it's not going to take any extra scanning time than we spend at the moment. But we need to retain the ability to produce both attenuation and non-attenuated planar scans because we know that's what the FDA and other regulators are used to. So we should be able to derive that from the spec data. So here's some examples. This is the planar scan on typical patient, anterior posterior views. These are reprojected. Um, these aren't MIPS. This is actually the whole data set attenuated and forward projected as, as you would in the imaging process um, for comparison. And this is a, um, a, a zone thing, the a priori attenuation with a bit of a thresholding issue in this at the moment. What I'm trying to show you, though, is that I think we can get very close to um, replicating planar imaging if we just do whole body spec, should we need to. I think it's just a transition phase that we would go through and we would move totally to 3D dosimetry. So that's really coming along. So we are now about ready to start to implement quantitative whole body spec for dosimetry. Uh, given the limitations that the biology still makes significant demands on the patient, number of time points over a number of days, but we're going to try and make that as easy as possible. We still have the poorest spatial resolution compared with, say, PET, which can cause significant underestimates of the lesion uptake and concentration. So perhaps you know, the, the smart reconstruction algorithms are going to start to help us to do that, to overcome that and get a better concentration uh, estimate. And we still need a finite time required to create a single whole body time point. But we've set our limits at about 30 minutes. We don't want to take any longer than that for a whole body spec CT. And this is underway now. 
So in the 2014 paper, these, sorry, the 20, uh, 2007 paper, these issues were listed as the challenges at the moment for doing whole body dosimetry. And uh, you can see there are a number of them. But I think as we look through them now, we're starting to tick off a lot of these and we, we can start to do something more realistic with this. So certainly issues of tissue, tissue heterogeneity and the more we learn about the genomics and the, the heterogeneity there is, is still not been addressed. Um, how do we detect minimal residual disease and treat it? Um, and what changes are due to the therapy itself? But many of the other issues I think we have built up in the past decade or so a significant body of knowledge about and have overcome a lot of the technical issues. So, in conclusion, are we getting any closer to this holy grail of individualised dosimetry? Um, the first message is SPECT imaging is becoming routinely quantitative, and that's going to be a big help. The dosimetry apps are becoming easy to use for a wider range of radionuclides. They're better validated and more widely available. The biodistribution imaging will be capable with quantitative whole body SPECT CT very soon to most of you. It's already available to some of us now. Uh, our knowledge base is expanding rapidly and there's a growing realisation amongst all of us, I think, that we need to move away from EBRT thresholds and also thinking about it like external beam radiotherapy, thinking more about the biologically effective dose. So what next? Well, for each therapy, each pathology, we need to establish the dose-response relationship. We need better levels of evidence. We've heard this message time and again today. For individual dosing needs to be produced, otherwise there's no need. We should just stick with the standard. Standardisation of the dosimetry calculations will be necessary. There's a number of different ways that people are doing it at the moment and the physicists need to get their act together a little bit and standardise that and harmonise. Multicentre RCTs will be desirable, if not essential, for wider acceptance. And we need to understand the radiobiology of low dose rate irradiation with beta radiation uh, much better than we do today. But I think with that, we're getting much, much closer to achieving this holy grail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dale, for an excellent overview of, uh, of this field and what the options are. I have uh, one question for you, or one uh, view, view into the future. As I see it, if we are very uh, circumscript, only looking at uh, PRT with lutetium-177, uh, if we look a couple of years ahead and we accept that we need to do individual dosimetry, which is not at all uh, maybe really proven, yep. Yep. do you rather think that we would do Q-spec on the first dose, or do you think that uh, imaging ligand like uh, copper-labeled somatostatin receptor uh, ligands will, uh, to do the pre-therapy dosimetry will, uh, will be the one if, winning if, this game? So if you've got a PET tracer that's got a long enough half-life then you would do it with PET, I'm sure. But we don't often have that. And also, if you think about CERT planning, you don't do it just to do the dosimetry. In fact, you don't do it to do the dosimetry. You do it to make sure you're not addressing non-target tissues and also to look at the, the liver-lung shunt fraction. So if you do that, for those reasons, you then get the, the dosimetry as well. So it's the motivation for doing it. Um, I tend to think with the PRRT, with lutetium, with amino acid infusions and all the other complications that I think you just use a standard dose first off. I think that's what we would do anyway. But I do think gallium-67 has got a role here. I really do. I think it's a wonderfully, wonderful long half-life, 78 hours. The, the cop-off. Yeah. No, the ga gallium-67. Yeah, oh, 67, sorry, yeah. Instead of gallium-68 yeah. in the PRRT environment. I think if people wanted to go down that path, then I think that's, a, that's possibly a good way to go because the imaging characteristics are quite good. Thank you. I think um, we have to move on. Um, can I and just sneak yeah, in yeah, one yeah, more? Yeah, sure, sure. While you're there. Um, just um, in a spirit of debate, I was a bit surprised to see you, your total exclusion of technetium as a, as a, as a, as a guide to, to um, dosimetry, um, given that the, ob the obvious radionuclide you would pair it with therapeutic therapeutically would be rhenium-188. And the half-life is only three times longer than technetium whereas the half-life of copper-67 is five times longer than copper-64. And especially with the improvements in SPECT that you proposed at yeah, the end, yeah. I would have thought there was an obvious re reason to use technology. I still think you, you need, most of these biological processes, you need to image probably beyond 24 hours. 
So I think that's pushing it a bit. I mean, if you're getting into rhenium and you're the longer, sorry, the shorter half-life of the therapy, perhaps that's a unique situation. But I dismissed it on the grounds of the shortish half-life relative to the biological half-times. Thank you. Steve, is there? Yeah. Dale, on your dosimetry curves and over multiple times, and you described it as bi-exponential, but a lot of those later ones look fairly linear, and as one of the earlier talk speakers today said, it was pretty well fixed from that point saying that you could measure it just, you know, six hours or 24 hours. Do you have a comment on that? Do you feel that you need the, the full out, or do you think you can just pick that first spot and... Um, I think the it's linear? the early phase that's really important to define, because we see a factor of two difference in kidney dosimetry based on the, the, uh, the fast component of clearance. The, um, the slow component is fairly stable. Uh, we've now moved our time points out further to get a better fix on that. Um, it's still around the, I think it's 58 hour half-life. Um, so possibly you could do that and certainly not all patients can come back on day three or five but they're usually happy to come back on, on day one. So we've usually got three points, so sort of half hour, four hour, 24 hours and that helps to define that early part. So I think you could probably get away with that but uh, I think the lesson we've learned from being involved in PRRT therapy from your endocrine tumours is that every patient's different um, and you don't want to make too many assumptions. Thanks. Thank you very Thank you. much.